master of all worlds, highest power, merciful parent of compassion, in your presence, eternal one, source of strength for us, as you have been for our ancestors, we very humbly acknowledge you. What are we? What, are we? what, what is, is our life we? that you have done, such, done such great kindness, kindness to us? Therefore, we, we place, place our appeals before, before you, so, you, so that, that you may forgive and absolve us of all our faults and failings, that our faults Therefore, never become barriers between, between us and you. you. And may, may it be your desire to tear our hearts, hearts to feel all and love for you. May you listen to the word of ours, ours, and may you open our hearts to the mysteries of your Torah. Torah. May this our study be a source of pleasure before your throne of glory, as we incense. You showered down upon us the light of our soul source, all the ways in which we find ourselves. May the sparks of your holy servants, you have revealed these words to the world, shine and sparkle. May they merit their merit, merit of their Torah, their innocence and their holiness. Stand for us, so as to send some women to study these words. Their merit, they are eyes illumined by what we study. As in the string of the sweet singer of Israel, open my eyes and I gaze great wonders of your Torah. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be to you, my rock and my redeemer. For it is eternal who grants wisdom. It is from his mouth that knowledge and understanding issue forth. Na 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 <laughs> Na 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 na
that what we're going to do is re-begin um, from page 368. We started, I think, this little story, but uh, I don't remember that we actually finished it, and uh, it doesn't hurt to uh, read a, a piece of Zohar again, right? So uh, 368 five lines from the uh, top where it says Rabbi Shimon went out. Okay. And I wonder, is anybody here uh, interested in the... Uh, uh, ah. Rabbi Shimon went out to the villages. He encountered Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Hia, and Rabbi Yossi. Upon seeing them, he declared, innovations of Torah are required here. They sat for three days as they were about to leave, each one opened with a verse. Okay, we'll stop for a second. So uh, again, we did read this the other time. Um, Rabbi Shimon apparently is going out on a business trip. That's what it means to go out to the villages. He had tenant farmers, apparently. He had little groups of uh, people that were farming uh, his lands. That's what it seems to be. Uh, this is a, a phrase that comes also from the Talmud. Um, and on the way, he uh, meets three of his students. And uh, when he sees them, he says, ah, oh, this is great. Let's do some uh, innovations of Torah. Let's do some chidushe Torah, right? Some new insights of Torah. This is what this, it's not a, a coincidence that we've met together. So instead of my going over and, and supervising my holdings, forget that. Let's let's instead let's study Torah together. You know that it's such a pleasure that we're all all of us together. So they sat for three days. Presumably, they're studying Torah together. Unbelievable Torah is being shared and learned, and uh, and created, um, and we have no clue whatsoever what happened. We have no idea what the content of that, uh, uh, that conference um, you know, uh, uh, came out to be. But we have now a record of what it was, the parting words of each of these three disciples of Rabbi Shimon. As they were about to leave, each of, one, each of them gives a kind of a final toast and let's see what they say. Rabbi Abba opened saying, <clears throat> yud heh vav -He said to Avram, after Lot had parted from him, raise your eyes now and look for the place where you are, to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. For all the land that you see, I will give you. Now, did Abraham inherit the land according to his range of vision and no further? How far can a human see? Three parasangs or four or five? I forgot how big a parasang is. And he yeah. said, for all the, the, the note below, it says a parasang is 3.5 miles. Uh, thank you. It's, I, I'm just looking at the notes. And he said, for all the land that you see, however, he saw in four directions of the world. He saw the whole world. 
for four directions of the world encompass the whole world. So one second before we get to the punchline. So this is a simple question. So God says to Abraham, look around and everything that you see is yours. Look around the whole land, all that you see is yours. So Rabbi Abba is being very literal. And he says, so is that the whole thing? So he sees about the, you know, 12 miles, 10, 11 miles, 15 miles in each direction. Is that it? Is that as much as what Abraham, was this the way, you know, if he had better eyesight, he would get more land. If he had not such good eyesight, uh, less land. If it was cloudy, it would be one. Is that what it's all about? That's all that you, he, he said, no. So it says all the land that you see. So rather, the answer is that by looking in all four directions, that is a kind of a symbolic taking in all of the land. Right? It's, it's not like if you just look out you know, on a clear day, you can see forever, but rather it's the, the, uh, the symbolism of turning to the four directions. We just finished Sukkot, and that's one of the things that we do on Sukkot. When we take the lulav and the etrog, we wave the lulav and the etrog to the four directions, we're saying God's glory is throughout the entire space, right? The entire physical space. And then we go up and down as well. So um, clearly God's glory is not, you know, if I have a long lulav, it's, it's you know, God's glory is, is uh, six feet. If I have a shorter lulav, it's only four feet. No, it, we're pointing to all the directions and that's what Abraham is doing. So Abraham is taking in, in a symbolic way, all of space and God says, it's all yours. It's all a gift to you. Further. Thank you. Further, the Blessed Holy One lifted the land of Israel and showed him how it was bound to the directions of the world. So he saw everything. Okay. So this is the idea, um, and you have in the note, raise your eyes now and look. So according to this reading, raise your eyes. Why? Because the land has actually been raised up. The Holy Blessed One lifted the land up and uh, showed Moses the inner guts of how the land, like the, the, the root uh, uh, networks that connect the land of Israel with all the rest of the world. So therefore, uh, Abraham was able to see that all of the land uh, in, in the world is tied to this central uh, focus. Read, read 30, 395, please. Oh, little 395. The Blessed Holy One lifted the land of Israel. Therefore, God told Abraham, raise your eyes now and look. According to rabbinic tradition, the land of Israel stands at the center of the world. The land of Israel sits in the center of the world, Jerusalem in the center of the land of Israel, the temple in the center of Jerusalem, the nave in the center of the temple, the ark in the center of the nave, and in front of the ark, the rock of foundation from which the world was founded. Okay, so here we have this idea that it's, this is the core, right? This is the central hub from which all the rest of the world radiates. So by lifting up that central uh, focus, God shows Abraham that it's all connected like spokes on a wheel. The whole rest of the world is, is connected to this uh, place. And since the world is round, the center of the world is the highest place uh, of the world. And therefore, right, right there, it's on top. And therefore, uh, uh, Abraham sees, he takes in the entire world. So this is one reading. Uh, that's obviously the choice that, that uh, Matt, uh, Danny Matt has made. But if you read the printed Aramaic, there's another reading. There the reading is, further, the Holy Blessed One lifted him over the land and showed him how it was bound 
to the directions of the world. So he saw everything. So these are two different readings. <coughs> the commentators are split about which reading they adopt. According to this other reading, not the reading that we have in our English translation, it's not, um, hold on a second here. It's not the land that's picked up, it's Abraham who's picked up. Abraham is lifted up and then he gets a bird's eye view of all of the land and then he sees how the land goes beyond and stretches to the four corners literally of the earth. Um, who does get lifted up? Um, in in the, in the later stories, Moses. Moses, Moses, Moshe. Right. We just finished reading the Torah, and that's Moses' last thing. He goes up to Mount Nebo, so that he can see from a high vantage point all of the land all around. So that's uh, that's one idea. And here, depending on how you read it. Either Abraham is having a similar experience, although he's being lifted up by God. So that's already a more spiritual kind of uh, elevation or the land itself is spiritually being elevated in his vision so that he can see everything. Okay, so this is all the Midrashic explanation for that verse um, in uh, Breshit in Genesis. And now here comes the final point. Similarly, Similarly, whoever sees Rabbi Shimon sees the whole world, the light of above and below. Okay, so this is the toast, so to speak. This is Rabbi Abba as he's bidding farewell to his teacher, going, Ab Abraham had to have God pick up the land so that he could see the whole land. We're so much more fortunate. You want to see the whole world? Just behold Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, right? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai encompasses the entire uh, cosmos. The entire world is above and below, is, in, is, in, is encapsulated in his being, all right? So high, high praise, uh, and this is his, of course, his parting words. Now there's another one, Rabbi Chia. So now we're on 369. Rabbi Chia opened saying, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your seed. Okay, now, this brings us a little closer to our own stories in the Torah that we're in, right? We're in Vayetze, and that's uh, um, Jacob's, um, you know, when he, when he comes to, the, to, the, uh, to that place and he collapses in exhaustion, and then he has the dream, and God says this verse. Right, so the land that you're lying down, he's he's sleeping on the land. This is in his dream with the ladder, right? So I'm going to give to you this land forever, to you and to your children. So now Rabbi Chia asks a similar question to the way Rabbi Abba, uh, Rabbi Abba asked the question. Now, now did the Blessed Holy One promise him only that spot? Look. It was no more than four cubits. However, within those few cu four cubits, the Blessed Holy One rolled up the whole land of Israel. So that spot comprised the whole land. Okay, so what's Rabbi Chia's uh, Midrash? And this is not his, this is not original to the Zohar. This is quoting a rabbinic Midrash that God, again, the question also, so the land that you, the, 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 the land on which you lie, if we take that hyper literally, so what is that? Was, was Jacob, was he six feet uh, tall? Maybe, I doubt it, right? Um, but uh, okay, four cubits, so he was six feet tall. So six feet of land, right? That's of course, the, you know, the same thing like a grave. That's how much God is promising him? The answer is no. What God did at that moment was God rolled up all of the land of Israel and tucked it under Jacob. And then God said, now the land that you're lying on is all yours, right? So uh, just like Jacob took a rock and put it under him, he, God takes the entire land of Israel and puts it under Jacob, okay? So 
Now we go to the punchline. Now, if that spot comprised the whole land, how much more so Rabbi Shimon, lamp of the whole world? Okay. So the same kind of idea. That, so Rabbi Shimon is an, a, a similar example of encompassing the whole world. Right? What's the, uh, uh, um, how much more so, right? How much more so? Why is that? If that spot comprised the whole land, how much more so, Rabbi Shimon? What's the big how much more so? I mean, God performs a miracle. God makes the land roll up and get condensed like a tzimtzum, right? A constriction and a condensation under Jacob's body so that Jacob could then, when lying on it, take possession of the land. So how much more so, if that could happen, then how much more so Rabbi Shimon, right? Um, what, how, what? what? What exactly is, is uh, Rabbi Chia pushing here? Well, part of it is the, the way that Rabbi, he describes Rabbi Shimon, right? Before we had Rabbi Shimon is the delight of the entire world, right? The whole world above and below takes pleasure in Rabbi Shimon. So now Rabbi Chia emphasizes in what sense does anybody or anything derive benefit from Rabbi Shimon? Because Rabbi Shimon is a lamp, right? Rabbi Shimon is this uh, uh, um, beaming source of light. And of course, by the way, light, until something stops the light, the light just keeps going. Right? So it just goes on infinitely. And Rabbi Shimon is that uh, um, lamp of the world. So, of course, that lamp of the world will stretch out to encompass the whole world, right? Because this is not a physical, but a spiritual expansion, right? Um, the spiritual, so much more. How much more so? The spiritual, so much more powerful uh, than, than the physical. More than that, the land of Israel is what's folded up underneath Jacob, right? Rabbi Shimon is the lamp of the entire world, not just the land of Israel, the entire world. Okay, good. And now the third of the three uh, students that uh, Rabbi Shimon met, now he has to say a, a, a parting toast to his teacher. So what does he say? Rabbi Yossi opened saying, this time I will praise yud hey bab -Hey. Okay, so wait a second, thank you. So now we've gotten back to our text. We've finally gotten to the story where we are paying attention to the birth of all of the children and the, uh, uh, the you know, the, the Rachel and Leah, what do they stand for and how do they uh, uh, work together? So now we're back to that final uh, place. Go ahead. This time, oh, I read that. Now, among all those whom she bore, was it fitting to praise the Blessed Holy One only for this one? However, Judah is the fourth son of the throne, consummating the throne. So Judah alone is perfection of the throne, bolstering all its supports. So who's this speaking? Leah is speaking. And she says, Hapam O De Hashem. Right? That the reason that Judah is called Judah, Yehuda, is because it comes from the word to thank, to praise. So O De Yehuda. So this time, Hapam, I will praise God for giving me this fourth child. So Rabbi Yossi says, What's the matter? You didn't praise God the first three times? Having a child is a blessing. So why why now is is the is the special time for for thanking God and praising God? Each child is a miracle into themselves. So ha pam this time, the answer is says Rabbi Yossi, that Judah is the fourth. Judah is the fourth. We've already had four corners of the earth, and we've had uh, the four cubits of space 
that were Jacob's uh, land, that was and then the place where everything was con concentrated. Right? And now we have Judah is the fourth son and Judah is the culmination of finally assuring God's presence in the world, the throne, right? The throne needs four legs to stand on. So this is, uh, finally, it, was, it wasn't just a, a, you know, rickety, but this confirms that the children of Israel, the children of Jacob through Leah, will be able to make God's presence sturdy and sustained in the world. So that's the, that's the, uh, um, the solidification. So that's the hapam. So this time now we've got it, finally, four. Okay, and now the punchline. How much more so Rabbi Shimon, who illumines the whole world with Torah, causing countless lamps to grow, to glow? So how much more so Rabbi Shimon is even better than, than uh, uh, Judah, right? Yehuda. How am I, why, why, why is uh, it so, how much more so now? Well, one way to look at it is he doesn't have three brothers. And he is just Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Now, how many disciples are in this story? Well, no, no, yeah, that's it. Now you got it. Now this is like an eye test. You want me to? You want me to tell you how many fingers you're holding up? Uh, three, so, three disciples, but four altogether. Three disciples and four. So again, we've got the four, and Rabbi Shimon is that culmination. Right? Rabbi Shimon is that culmination, but in a certain sense, he is unique and singular. His disciples are much more subsidiary. In the four brothers, Reuven, Shimon, Levi, and Yehuda, they are equal uh, uh, in their standing as the four legs of the throne. But Rabbi Shimon is all by himself. And he is the one who's not only a lamp for the whole world, but what does he do? He causes countless lamps to glow, right? The light that he shines forth ignites other lights. And this is what it's all about. This is the idea of spreading God's uh, uh, reality into the world. So this is uh, um, high praise for Rabbi Shimon. So we have three uh, toasts offered by the three disciples as they say goodbye to their teacher, each one appreciating uh, their teacher very much. And of course, these are the words that we hear as opposed to the mystery, the, you know, the, the empty uh, space that we never found out whether that other, what was the Torah that they studied all that time? We have no idea. All we know is that they're so grateful and so inspired by their teacher. Okay, um, so these are uh, short texts that basically, um, aggrandize Rabbi Shimon as the leader of the pack, so to speak, as the great, great singular figure of his generation. Um, and this is a theme that, of course, goes throughout, um, throughout the, uh, the Zohar. So it's not so much that we need to learn new things about God or new things about the human soul or new things about uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the nature of the world. But this is simply a pause. And that's why it's after all of that other Torah, which needs to be unpacked some other time in other parts of the Zohar. This is simply a celebration of how wonderful it is to have this very exceptional um, uh, teacher. Um, and that's the Zohar develops into this uh, um, you know, hagiographic uh, 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 celebration of, of Rabbi Shimon. You know, when, when he finally goes up into heaven, it becomes this you know, amazing uh, uh, story of, of uh, the heavens celebrating and opening up and he becomes transformed and, uh, and, and so on. So this little section is simply in praise of Rashbi. David, you wanted to say something. 
Yeah, the story of lifting the land versus lifting Avram is a uh, a midrash, is it not? I mean, I, it's, it's this. It's not in the text. It's, in, it's in the two Torah. different. It's two different texts. It's two different readings. If we, if you took the the Aramaic text as printed in most oh. Zohar uh, uh, books oh. today, it says that uh, I'll, I'll read to you the text where I just put it here. Right. I'll read it to you half a second. Give me a half a second here. It says. It says. How come? Where are we here? Where are we? One fifty six A. So wait. Here. Right, right before that. So we're talking Rabbi Abba, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So it says like this. It says, two, moreover, right? Zakafle Kuchabrichu al Arad Israel. The Kaddish Baruchu, the Holy Blessed One, Zakafle picked him up over the land of Israel. That's the printed version that we have. But Danny Matt's translation works not only with the printed version, but he also looks at, at manuscripts. So in certain manuscripts, it doesn't say Zakafle, it says Zakaf. Ara the Israel. He picked up the land of Israel, or Zakaf Lala Ara the Israel. And then when you look in the commentaries, voila, you can see that, that uh, Rabbi Moshe Kodaviro has one reading, and Rabbi Avram Galanti has the other reading. So already these readings, these are you know pre publication, these readings are circulating. And then he picked the, the one that he thinks is the better reading. Mm -hmm. But the other reading exists. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now we go back to um, the story in the Torah. And uh, the sons uh, are in the process of all being born. Um, and we still have this little competition between Leah and Rachel. Right? Um, Rachel is, is frustrated that she has not been able to uh, have children. So in the indentation, what does it say? In the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field. So he finds mandrakes in the field. It's some kind of uh, uh, plant. Uh, apparently they look a little bit like human beings. And uh, a lot of uh, traditions see mandrakes as a kind of an aphrodisiac or a kind of fertility thing. Um, and he finds these mandrakes and the Torah then says that as he's coming back, he wants to give them to his mother. Who is his mother? Who's his mother? Leia. 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 Right? So he wants to give it as a gift to his mother. Ruvain is a nice guy. This is another very touching little Peace, you know, if, if you wanted to write a little short story about this guy, Reuven, you know, you would, there are a number of uh, episodes where Reuven figures, you know, as we go on in the Torah. Um, this is the first one. So we have him as a, as a kind of a very loyal, faithful son, and he wants to bring a present to his mother. Very sweet. Maybe he doesn't even know what, you know, what, what the cultural associations are of mandrakes. He just found them and he wants to give a, a gift to his mother. So then what happens is um, and he brought them to his Leia, his mother. We have the full text uh, in the thing there. No, usually he gives us the full text, but too bad. Okay. So he brought it to, then it says, Vatomer Rachel Eleah. 
So Rachel said to Leah, Tanina li mi duda ebenech. Please, give me some of those uh, uh, dudaim that your son brought. So what do you think of that request? Jen. So she's possibly sees it as an aphrodisiac or something that will improve her fertility. And she's, you know, will it, a desperate enough to put aside her um, competition and just actually ask outright for it. So, so she's asking outright for it. I would just add, there's a little bit of chutzpah here, right? It's, it's, this is a gift that my child is giving me. And now my competitor, my sister, you know, is saying, well, oh, can you give me some of those uh, special little things that your son so devotedly gave, wanted to give to you? How about if I take them? I would kind of say then, could you give me some of those things that my nephew gave to you? Uh -huh. <laughs> so so that's what she says, give me some of those mandrakes of your son. Um, uh, next verse. So Leah says back to her, Is it a small matter? It's not enough that you took my, my man from me, that you also now want to take my son's uh, uh, gift, my, the dudaim, the, the mandrakes that he brought for me. You want to take that away from me also? So she says it straight out. She says, what do you think you're doing here? Why does everything go to you? Can I get a, a present from my own son? You took my man away. So now here's Rachel. Batome Rachel, Lachain. Okay, Lachain. All right, all right. Therefore, Yishkav imach halayla tachat duda ebenech. He will sleep with you tonight in exchange for your son's duda ebenech. Right, so a little, this is called transactionalism, right? So, okay, all right, so I'll give you back your man. Take your man and let me have the mandrakes. Um, and then what happens? Jacob comes from the field by Erev in the evening. So Leah went out to meet him. Batomer, Eli Tavo. You are coming to me. Um, and the word tavo is, uh, has, is a double entendre, right? It means that you will come to me, and it means just like in English, you will come to me. Um, For I have rented you through uh, the mandrakes of my son. And indeed, he slept with her that night. So that's the story as much as we need it for right now. Okay, so here we go. Rabbi Yitzchak. Rabbi Yitzchak opened. O yud hey bav hey, how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. This verse has been established in numerous places, but who can enumerate the works of the Blessed Holy One? For well, he created so many forces and camps, each differing from the other and all simultaneously, like a hammer scattering sparks within sparks simultaneously in every direction. So the Blessed Holy One generated so many species and camps one differing from the other, countless, all simultaneously. Okay, so um, the connection with our uh, story is not yet clear at all. Instead, we've got this very exalted, excited celebration of God's creativity, taking from uh, uh, Psalm 104, um, the Rosh Chodesh Psalm, one of the beautiful, wonderful Psalms about how unbelievable God's creation is, right? And it's been established in numerous places. Many people have already commented 
on this verse. But who can enumerate the works of the Blessed Holy One? You can talk about this from morning till night and you still won't exhaust what there is to say. Right? Even though so many people have already spoken this verse and explained this verse, there's no end to it. There's no end to the, to the wonder and to the uh, 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 abundance of God's uh, handiwork. So what does that mean now? What is it God's creation that we're celebrating? For he created so many forces and camps. So in uh, Psalm 104, as you, read the, as you continue to read the Psalm, it gives you this panoramic view of the world. So it's an amazing picture of nature and of the flora and the fauna and everything is, is uh, you know, happening in the, in the morning, in the evening and the, uh, uh, you know, the human being is, is harmoniously living with all of the, uh, the animals and the, and, the, uh, and the natural stuff. That's the, that's the Psalm. But now, says Rabbi Yitzchak, what's this am amazing abundance of creativity that God has uh, uh, engaged in? Forces and camps. What does the note say? Of angels. And angels, in other words, forces, divine, spiritual uh, 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 energies that take shape and that take form in different ways but that really should not be simply looked at as, oh, look, there's a sparrow and there's an eagle and there's a river and there's a tree. No, these are all uh, you know, emanations of God, each one in its own way, uh, a, 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 a you know, special, unique kind of uh, flow from God, and yet all at the same time, right? all simultaneously. And then we have this image, right? Like a hammer scattering sparks within sparks simultaneously in every direction. So here is where the Zohar again takes a known accepted image and pushes it one step further, pushes it one step further. Um, the hammer scattering sparks, first of all, that image comes from Jeremiah. So Jeremiah says the following. Jeremiah is, is, has God complaining about all these false prophets whose words are worthless. And then God says, this is chapter 23, verse 29. Hello, You know what my word is like? My word, the authentic word of God, is like fire says God, and like a hammer that smashes the rock. That's the, uh, 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 this is not just some, you know, wishy-washy kind of uh, um, saying, but God's, you know, word has awesome power, energy, frightful, power like fire, like a hammer smashing uh, a stone. The rabbis took that and uh, worked with it as an image of the Torah. That the Torah is God's word. And that's the idea of the, of the sparks coming out of the Torah when you hit the word, when you, when you God's each word makes more and more sparks fly, right? So that there are uh, so many different ways to understand the Torah, so many different implications of the Torah and so on. Um, Rashi uh, cites this at one point when he quotes like, there's a Midrash that says the verse means like this. And then there's another Midrash that says the verse looks like, means like this. And then there's another Midrash. He says, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do? God's word is like, it's like the hammer that smashes the rock. So this is all going from the prophets into the, into the rabbis in the Talmud, into Rashi in the commentaries. And now what the Zohar does is it takes the same thing and it adds sparks within sparks, even better. 
right? This is the sparks are, are, are banging into each other. This is like a real nuclear reactor where everything is banging into each other and, and the sparks are flying, not just from that one hit, but again and again and again and again, all, all over the place. And this is God's word, which is God's creation of the world. And that expression of God is both in the form of Torah and in the form of the world. The Torah and the world are intimately uh, uh, you know, tied to each other. Right? So, so this is the amazingness that uh, uh, Rabbi Yitzchak um, is celebrating. So many different kinds of divine uh, energies, so many species and camps, right? Collections, we would call it maybe molecules or force fields of stuff all circulating around each other, different, infinite, countless, all at the same time. Okay? So this is to get us, you know, into a sense of wonder. Now, come and see. Come and see. By speech and spirit as one, all was fashioned as is written. By the word of yud heh vav -Heh, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their host. By the word of yud heh vav -Heh, speech. By the breath of his mouth, spirit. One does not proceed without the other one merged with the other, and from them emerged hosts upon hosts, camps upon camps, all simultaneously. Okay. So the expression of God's creativity is reality, as we call it, right? Whatever is, is an expression of God. One of the key ways that we can think of expression is talking. Express yourself. Learn how to express yourself. So this is, of course, in this week's Torah reading, God talks the world into being. Right? Baruch she'amar olam, Because the world is God's expression. Is, is God pouring out of, out, expressing uh, God's self outward into the world. So the verse says, um, um, Right? So you've got the Dvar Hashem, the word, and you've got Ruach Piv. So Ruach Piv, even though it's second in the verse, Ruach Piv, and also just kind of uh, uh, physically speaking, Ruach Piv is prior to the word. Ruach is what you you know push through your teeth and your and your and your tongue and your palate and so on, and you create uh, sounds out of that ruach, out of that spirit, out of that you know, air. And by cutting it up into pieces, you end up creating words. You end up making that energy more distinct and more communicable, more understandable, more, apprehend more apprehendable. So the ruach comes first, even though it's uh, mentioned second. And then the speech comes later. So this is the amorphousness of Ruach, right? Spirit doesn't have shape necessarily. And then a word is a word. And of course, in Hebrew, a word is also a thing, right? So Ruach is no thing and words are things. So out of the no thing, comes the thing. And this is God's amazing, miraculous power to do that. And not just do it once, and not just do it for one kind of thing, but for everything in, in you know, manifold, manifold, manifold ways. Um, Matt gives us uh, the spherot that are associated with this. We get this in other places, and we've had it before too. This is part of the image that we've had before of creation as, a, as not just emanating like light, but of speaking. First, God has a thought. Then God conjures the thought up. 
starts forming you know the the pre-word the pre-vocal aspect of speaking and then starts talking and that is the step-by-step -step image using speech as uh, as understanding god's manifestation and then speech therefore is the final product that means shechina and the ruach which takes shape as speech right and the speech is by taking the ruach containing it shaping it forming it the ruach is therefore the higher force um and uh it, you know uh, uh, identified of, uh, with uh, um with the tiferet sometimes it's not just ruach it's called coal right voice okay so all of this then comes out into sentences and paragraphs and, and uh, paragraphs of, of, of reality. We got, we're going to get to the, to the whole punchline here. Come and see. <laughs> we're at the second come and see, right in the middle of the page. Come and see. When the Blessed Holy One wished to create worlds, he generated a single concealed light from which radiate all those revealed lights. From that light issued other lights, forming, spreading, becoming the higher world. Okay, this is again a recap of the myth of creation as understood by the Zohar and as explicated many, 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 many times. So what's the first stage of creation? according to this short paragraph. What's the very first step that, that is necessary for creation to happen? Speech, one burst or beam of light now. Look at the, look at the paragraph. First words. He, he, he wishes to create a world. Yes. In order to create, you have to want to create. You know, it's like changing the light bulb. You have to want to create. So this is the ultimate mystery because creation is gratuitous. Nobody forced God to create the world. Nobody, God didn't have to do anything. So the idea that the world is created it comes out of God's own free will. But free will is too, is too uh, um, parav, a term. It comes out of God's desire. It comes out of God wanting. God wants to create a world and therefore God goes about creating the world. So the whole foundation of the world, the whole foundation of all existence is desire. That's what makes the world go round. That's what makes the world be. That God wanted something. Because otherwise, God had everything. God is everything. God wanted there to be something created. That's the first step. So that's so esoteric, right? That's so... Nobody can know what somebody else wants. Nobody can really understand what a person wants. Most of the time, we can't even understand what we want. So, so the, the wanting is one of the most mysterious you know, items that we could possibly try to wrap our minds around. And that's, says the Zohar, that's the way it should be. Because that's so far up there in the mystery of creation that it's just, you know, um, it's inexplainable. Why did God, why did God want to, you know, it's like with little kids. So why did God want to do that? Well, because God wanted to, but why did God want to do that? Right, you, that, that's the mystery. That's the mystery. So God wished to create worlds. So then we go through the next steps and that's what people um, have already mentioned. So the first thing is a single concealed and of course, that's in itself a kind of an oxymoron. 
this is a light of darkness, right? It's a light, but it doesn't illuminate anything. That's the opposite of Rashbi. Why is Rashbi celebrated so much on the previous page? Because God, his shining light just, you know, goes everywhere and actually makes other lights go on, right? So, but first we have this concealed light from which radiate all those revealed lights. So that's the next step. Somehow or other, that concealment is cracked open and revelation happens, right? Lights start proliferating. All those revealed lights from that single concealed light. And then other lights forming, spreading, becoming the world that we have, not yet, the higher world. This is still way before we get to our world. This is all the necessary steps that God had to make happen to prepare the way for a world to, uh, 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 to come into being. Okay. Now, here we go. This supernal light. The supernal light extended further, fashioning an artesian. An artisan. An artisan, a light that does not shine, fashioning the lower world. Being a light that does not shine, it yearns to join above and yearns to join below. And by joining below, it joins illuminatingly the juncture above. This light that does not shine through joining above generated all forces and camps of many kinds. As is written, O yud heh vav -Hey, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. <coughs> so who wants to describe these next steps? What is what is what happens next? The higher worlds, the supernal light, fashions an artisan. The word artisan is uman, right? Um, in modern Hebrew, art is umanut, um, and this is a word that's taken from uh, Mishle, from Proverbs, where wisdom, Sophia says, I was God's uh, uman, right? I nestled in God's bosom. Uh, and uh, then, of course, I, I made uh, everything happen. So this kind of creation myth has ancient, ancient roots. Um, in Migilat Esther, we have a, a phrase, a, the word there also, Vayihi omein et Esther, Mordechai took care of Esther, right? He sort of adopted her. So the Uman is both someone who does things, but does things out of caring, right? Does things because they are investing their desire in, in making whatever it is that they're, that they're making, making it right, making it good. So this is the, uh, um, the uh, agent right, that will start putting together these lights into some kind of coherent system. But this Uman has an interesting quality. What is it? A light that does not shine. Yeah. A light that does not shine. So before we had the paradox of a light that's concealed. But at least then we could say, well, you know, if the light is, is being hidden, if you take away the hiding, you'll see the light. So the light is shining. It's just that you can't see it because it's being covered up by something. Now we have a bigger paradox. We have a light that does not shine at all. So what does this light do? It takes the light 
and it makes something out of it. Right? It takes it in and then it fashions the world. Craig, you wanted to say something. It, it's describing Shechina in the sense of the moon. The moon is a light that doesn't shine. It right. reflects, but it, it doesn't it, shine. Right, it doesn't shine of itself. Right? I mean, the moon shines, right? You know, otherwise, you know, people, it depends how you want to define be able to, to, you know, to have a good time without the moonshine. But, uh, but, it's, but it's, but it's, re it's reflected. Yeah, Larry. It's also like uh, plants with like chlorophyll, because chlorophyll, like in other words, the sunlight comes in, and it's not like the plant is shining, but the plant then turns the sunlight into something you know it, it turns it into a product or a, a growth turn, it turn, yeah into growth it turns it into physical life right it take it takes that energy and it and it makes it into more leaves and more stems and and bigger ones right so it's a that, receptacle receptacle but a create a creative receptacle right right so this uh -huh. is uh, a shorthand we've sometimes called it shrina Right, um, and uh, that's what it's be, what's being uh, said here, and then we have this description about Shekinah. Jen, you wanted to say something. I, it's a question that I, I feel like I should already grasp, but I completely don't grasp. So, before creation, before the desire, is, is Shekinah uh, with God already, or is Shekinah part of what comes out of creation? So this is the Zohar is always careful to remind us that we don't know what we're talking about when we talk about these things. So um, let's let's take note of that, and then say what we're talking about before this is Ein Sof. Before this, okay, is which we can't talk of, about really. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Is 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 some kind of total all encompassing, amorphous, mysterious everything. So when you say was Shechina with God at that point, there, everything was with God at that point, but nothing okay. was differentiated. Okay. Nothing, at least from our perspective, right? Nothing was able to be labeled, oh, this is this part of infinity, and this is that part of infinity. And this is, so that's where the mystery of the desire comes in. The mystery of the desire is to transform what cannot be talked about into something that can be talked about. Because it's weird to even think of like Ein Sof being familiar enough for us to say ain, it had a desire. Ein Sof, I'm sorry. Right. Ein Sof like to Ayn say Rand, like- but like Ein Sof. Okay, sorry, Ein Sof. So we can't really even say Ein Sof had a desire. And it's like, it's weird to think about it that way then because we don't really know anything. And yet we have to say there was and a yet, desire there. And yet we have to say it, right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yes. Where? Who? Yeah. What? So is um Rich. Is yeah, is the light that does not shine, is that not unlike the idea we were talking about a couple sentences earlier? Which idea? Just uh in order the very first how did uh this creation process begin, you asked. And in that previous paragraph it was with, yeah. with the idea. So, with thought. so Okay, so that's that's a, an interesting kind of tying the beginning with the end, right? And that's what we say sometimes, right? Sof ma'aseb ma'achshavat chila. We say that in lechad odi. That the ending, whatever comes out, was already there in germination, in 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 potentia. It, it was all there at the very beginning, right? So um, the but but in a very different way right because because at the point what that we're first talking about it when we talk about this mysterious um, desire that doesn't make any sense um, we haven't yet fully unpacked this this light imagery right it's 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 not a light in in at all it's a desire it takes it chooses, this path of light, right? So the desire then leads to generating a single concealed light. And then it ramifies and ramifies. And by the time we get now to the end, 
we get this, uh, again, creative uh, artisan entity, but it already has all the materials at its disposal. And yet it seems to me that um, this desire is never gonna be fully baked. It's not like I desire an apple. It's I desire um, something that's gonna evolve. So very interesting, very interesting. So where does that desire actually then ultimately find, find itself uh, nested? In us. So talk about half-baked. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's a good point, what you're saying. That, that, the, the desire, that germ of desire, in the end, comes rolling down into creating us flesh and blood desirers. Right? And then the whole struggle of how do we cope with our desires and what do we do with our desires and, and, and uh, you know, how do we marshal them and how do we channel them? That's the, uh, you know, the, by the, we were talking before when we were looking at the, at, the, at the Torah portion, where God goes, I created this whole thing, but oh my God, now boy, do I, do I reg regret it. Human beings are messing up royally. Why? Because this, this untrammeled desire that God infused into the world is out of control, completely out of control. And that's the, the, uh, the story of the rest of, uh, of the Torah is, how are we going to salvage this, right? How are we going to take our, our desires and love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? The rabbis go with all your desires, with your evil inclination and your positive inclination. How, how can we channel it like that? That's, you know, that's the challenge. And I think that what you're saying is, is, is you know, very, very much, you know, to the point. That's part of that's that's the stickiness, or that's the the uh, um, can I say, you know, the the, uh, the slipperiness of desire. No matter how concretely it ends up uh, being being housed, it's still a mystery. The mystery, you know, just is not going to get uh, killed or frozen or flattened out. All right, I think maybe we'll stop with that. And uh, we'll uh, try to remember how to uh, make all these connections work with the rest of the uh, explanation next next time. Okay? Good. Dr. Koa. Okay. Koa. Oh.